that's relevant to the time in which we live. What's wrong with the church? What's wrong with the church? A very interesting dialogue takes place in Matthew chapter number 16, uh, where Jesus speaks to the disciples and tells them, Upon this rock I build my church, gates of hell shall not prevail against it, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Uh, but what's so interesting is, is that I found this little tidbit in my Christian thought class on earlier this morning, and it says here, we have counted on preaching, teaching, and knowledge of information to form faith in the hearer, and have counted on faith from the inner life and outward behavior of the Christian. But for whatever reason, this strategy has not turned out well. And the result is that we have multitudes of professing Christians who may be ready to die, but are not ready to live. And can hardly get along with themselves, much less with others. He says, we have a whole lot of Christians who may be ready to die, but are not ready to live. And can hardly get along with themselves, much less with others. It was Alvin Toppler that said in 1970 that the illiterate of the 21st century are not those that cannot read or write, but those that cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. And because of this understanding, we have to understand that we are at a very critical point as it relates to the body of Christ because we're getting ready to see the church in a whole new light. Uh, God is about to demonstrate himself in ways that we have never imagined. Uh, you know, these are not the days in which we uh, sitting here trying to struggle and trying to make ends meet, robbing Peter to pay Paul as it relates to kingdom building. But we're going to see people who are not necessarily bound by any religious persuasion, not bound by any denominational set, but we're going to see people that are coming together, black, white, Hispanic, different cultures for the kingdom of God. What's so interesting here is that Jesus begins to give us an understanding. Luke picks up on it. Uh, in the book of Acts, verse number 3, it says that he sat with them and spoke to them about the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. But when you look at Matthew, chapter number 6, and verse 33, he gives us the meaning of the kingdom of God. The expression, his kingdom, is used in any cases as it relates to being something that is both to come and is present right now. In other words, he's trying to get us to understand that you are saved. You are being saved and you shall be saved. Jesus didn't just die and we just died and go to heaven. But he desired that we would establish the kingdom of God on the earth. We pray it all the time when he says, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But our stagnant and majority have told us that when we get saved and we get saved and we get sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost, that the only thing we exist to do now is die and get there. When Jesus intended for something to come right here. So when we understand this, and we understand the power of the kingdom, this kingdom revolution that we're talking about, uh, it's going to be a foundation. I'm going to be working on a new book on this. Uh, when you talk about the kingdom of God, you've got to understand that there's a difference between the kingdom and the church. There's a difference between the kingdom and the church. The church is the microcosm of the kingdom. The church is the microcosm of the kingdom. It is the extension of God's hand in the earth realm. The church is nothing that is physical, but it is universal. It is a spiritual entity. It is an organism that is uniquely divinely connected from God that he has placed in the earth to transform society, to transform culture, to transform how we think about how we live. It is Dan Kimball, who in this month's Outreach Magazine, he said, the church is a beautiful, wonderful, living thing. We are the body of Christ, yet we are all sinners and make mistakes. He says, I hope we will recognize the mistakes we make, repent and apologize, and hope that we do whatever it takes to remain pure, move ahead on our mission into the culture. But listen to what he says. He says, what I think is, most people mean that they like Jesus, but don't like what he 
people have turned the church into. We need to explain that those who like Jesus, but not the church, is that if they truly like Jesus, they cannot help but like the church because the church is his bride. And because they need the church as an expression of Jesus, if they put their faith in him, they are supernaturally a part of the church. In other words, what he's trying to get us to understand is, is that we have divided and made this distinction between uh, what we do because we mastered the Sunday hymns and we mastered everything else. We mastered how to do the all and dance and how to do all that other stuff, but we have not mastered how it is to transform how the world thinks. And that's why when you walk outside and you say you're a believer, people don't have any respect or disdain as it relates to you because we have created this environment in which we are so holy that we cannot sit down and minister and meet the needs of the common people. And because of that, we explained to you last week that there are seven sectors that control how a society functions. Seven different sectors. If you're taking notes, number one is religion. Number two is government. Number three is business. Number four is education. Number five is media. Number six is family. And number seven is arts and entertainment. There are seven distinct spheres that control how a society thinks. If you enter into how it thinks, you're able to transform society. Look around us. Look at the city. Look at what's going on in our culture today. Look at what's going on around the world today. Whether you're listening online, whether you're watching, we are literally in a crisis moment right now. Go online and you go inside of the MTA stations and I'm looking around and they just invested over $24 million for signs and ads in the train stations that say no God, no problems. So we are literally at a crucial point as it relates what it is to be a believer. Can I go deeper? Yeah. The word Christian, Dan Merchant says, now comes with some rather dubious baggage. And the word born again or evangelical in front of the word Christian, and many Americans will assume you are a Republican who hates gays, abortionists, and all types of organizations. The perception of our faith is not particularly flattering and seems to be based on what we're against rather than what we stand for. Hmm. We have to understand that Jesus preached a gospel of transformation, a gospel of repentance. That means that we had to literally rethink everything that we thought of when we came in tune with God. Hmm. Repent comes from the Greek word metaneo, which means to think again, to look at what everything you thought it was and to see how God has transitioned and showed us what it is. The church is a very interesting situation, a very interesting organization. As you read, as Mrs. Keenan read Acts chapter number two, the church is, according to scripture, the sixth dispensation. The church was clearly prophesied by him and it was purchased by his shedding blood on Calvary. The church was purchased by his shedded blood on Calvary. Now the commission was not for them to stay inside of the walls, but for them to reshape how the people outside of the walls see God. We've made a mistake today because we always say and we make the statement that if you just get here and get saved and stay inside here, you are on your way and you're sure to see God. But we walk outside those doors Never tell anybody else about God. Nobody else knows who we are. We sit around every single day and there is no change or transformation where we are because God is so private and personal, we are too scared to tell somebody else. Mm -hmm. The Christian belief system. Grace to you. Wasn't that a powerful word that you just heard on our Expect Greater broadcast? I am so excited and delighted to be invited into your time today. Do us a favor. Log on now. 
DaSharon.com. Hit that contact us and let us know that you've been blessed by another Expect Greater broadcast. And also, you can order right now my two books. My first one, Popularity is Not Enough, and my second one, Begin Again. I'm excited about your future. That's it, that's it. Expect Greater. See you later. Bye-bye.